Ashley Gregory, who will be re interviewing Rob Ritchie, Chris Chapman and James Burgess. sets and being told that we need these building as 3D models and then once there was a builder's 3D models we can then move the camera wherever we like and get the angles that's needed to, to do the story. And while I'm doing that, a team of animators are busy doing all the character animation and once they're finished they send everything to me and then I stitch it, everything together and give it to BBC Studios at the end, a broken man. <laughs> it does break you, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. It breaks you over and over again. We just keep coming back from I am I'm broken now. And I'm not even a 1% complete of the faceless ones. <laughs> what, what software do you use to make them? Uh, so the 3D stuff's done in, in, a, in a very niche bit of software called Lightwave 3D, which there's not really a lot of Lightwave users around anymore. Um, and everything gets put together in Adobe After Effects. And then put further together in Adobe Premiere. What do you use for uh, uh, reference points? Do you use like camera scripts, production, or te production stuff, or tele snaps? So uh, well, the director will, will on, on these animations, will go through the tele snaps and then make their own judgment on if they're going to use the tele snap in this place or that place. But then they'll go further and draw storyboards for the entire story and then match that to the audio. And then I'm sent that as a video and then I'll have to go through and splice off every shot and then work to that shot individually. So I work to a moving animatic which is locked to the audio and we can make little changes to where things might cut here and there, but very slightly. But it is a, it is a good guide to, to work into. And Rob, uh, what do you have on your phone today? What's on your phone? Nothing's on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the web affair episode three, you happy? I will, I've got some of some of the Facebook ones, which is complete. But it's looking very nice. Thank you. Are you going to share? Not a chance. <laughs> <laughs> As I'll be off this project before you can see. But you've got an interesting thing on Facebook one, don't you? Your is the first one where you'll be animating the surviving episodes as well as the yeah missing. Yeah. So th this was a, a bit of a surprise to people and a bit of a surprise to me actually. Um, but I can understand why. BBC made the decision to animate six episodes and two of them already exist because they want a, a, a uniform product which might have bigger appeal in America or uh, other parts of the world. So I can understand for that. Um, but I, I can also at the same time understand other people's confusion saying, well, why aren't you doing Underwater Menace two episodes <laughs> when you're doing <laughs> a wet attack? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's aging this dramatically. I mean, with, with these animations, they give a. Uh... The story is a grander scale than, than what can be achieved by that. Like, like Macro Terry, you almost liberated the, the free from those kind of <coughs> restrictions. I mean, how is that working? Uh, like, I do like that more free brain. Well, it was definitely useful on, on the Macro Terry because we only, well, the original only had one prop that was a, a flimsy latex thing mounted to a truck. <laughs> um, and I had a bit of technology now that they didn't have back in 1967, which is copy and paste. So I could just develop a, an army of macro very easily. So it's a, it's a bit unfair, really, but 
It, hel it helps tell the story. With something like the fiercest ones, I mean, they did a lot of filming at Gatwick, so that was quite grand in itself. So it's just trying to replicate what they did. So you can't really take too many liberties with it. <laughs> okay, what, what can you say about the faces one was an hour? I remember we were talking last night. With some. Well, I think I'm being brutally honest. I think I've said too much. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. is, it, is it going to be available, is it available in black and white and colour? Yeah, I think the BBC have already said that it's going to be a, a black and white and colour uh, release. Um, I don't know the release date. Uh, I just know it's next year. Mm. I think we saw, we saw in the trailer there's those little Easter eggs uh, with magpies uh, electrical. <laughs> there's some in Sharda as well in the Doctor's. Uh, uh, yes, I hit Jodie Whittaker's name on a car license plate. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the Easter eggs on the, on the trailer for the faceless ones were only there because when I was building the check-in section of Gatwick Airport, I found some really useful pictures taken around about the time. and. 1967 Britain was all about smoking and smoking companies, tobacco companies, and around the top of the, the whole check-in area, there was advert after advert for smoking company, and I replicated that properly. But then as I submitted it, there was a thing about, yeah, you'll have to take any kind of smoking reference out. Um, so then I just had a quick look through the hard drive, I thought, oh, Magpie Electrical, that can go. International Electromatics, that can go. So that was an accidental Easter egg, but yeah. Uh, keep the, keep your eye out on the faceless ones because I'm trying to hide in quite a few fun <laughs> ones here and there. I might even hide Chris in there somewhere. <laughs> I do so happy. <laughs> I, I know, I know uh, different languages could take time. I mean, how long roughly would it take you to do like a frame or, or, um, uh, or to do it as a whole? Because they're saying Power of the Dark, which was like about six months. Yeah, it was, it was six months of work in total, but about or for me to, by the time I had all the character animation in to put them with the backgrounds, it was about four months to do. Two quite quick and that was, yeah, it was, yeah. A, it, was a, it was a stupid turnaround. Uh, but it, it, turned, it turned out good, people, people liked it and it got, got a big hype when it was released. Um, I don't know if I really thought about how long it takes to do a frame because it doesn't kind of work that way for, for the stuff I do because technology is very cheap all these days in the sense that you can move something at the start of the sequence and then move your timeline right along to the end and move the camera there, there and it will just from that point to that point work its own movement so um, I can probably do a scene of about 20 shots in about a day um, that's when I, that's a good day a bad day is like one shot trying to where if I'm if I'm trying to kill a character in a, an amusing way or not amusing way um, in a graphic way, I can spend ages on, on one shot that's probably five seconds long, if that. And I get really annoyed about that. But just get on with it. Yeah. I mean, what's been the most challenging story to do so far? Um, probably I'll say faceless just because there's a lot more sets, it's a lot more involved, it's a lot more open air. So if, you, if you're building something and, and trying to do a shot that's set outside of Gatwick, the, the, the scene doesn't just end 10 feet in front of you, you've got to have the entire backdrop and the fall off where you can just about make out buildings in the distance and stuff like that, so that, that, that's all, that takes a while to settle. But I'm, I'm sure it'll look good in the end. With, uh, with obviously, the more animation, it's great to see interesting stories. Do you know if there might be any hints on what we might see in the future, or not too distant future? Because I mean, there's an on the map that still the world. I'm still doing faceless ones, can I? It's hell for where? No. <laughs> you did uh, the first ten minutes of the Wheel of Space, which I thought was amazing. Yeah, yeah, that was that was also a bizarre choice to do, um, and I think it might have just been a. Well, it was, it was just filling a gap really from from the BFI, who, who I think I believe funded it. Uh, because they had the Miss and Believe wipe event mm, and yeah. they thought could we have some form of Doctor Who animation for, for this event and I think through budget they probably said well we can probably trim uh, Wheel in Space episode 1 down to 10 minutes so we did just that. So, I, I remember when we were choosing these animations uh, I remember saying last night you don't get a say in them mm. do you know who does is it, is it BBC America or is it uh, you know what, I've never even seen what these meetings look like, whether or not everyone wears cloaks and it's in, held in a dark room. 
Um, but no, I, I, I don't even know how they decide what, what, what's next. And I'll, 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 in some cases, find out just a week before I'm about to start, which is what happened with Faceless. I was still finishing off Macro Terra, and then I uh, had the phone call and uh, could barely even finish it before I'd started. The, uh, um, is, is, is there a missing story you'd like to do that's not been done yet? Um, you know, I, I think anything from William Hartnell, um, purely because we haven't really touched upon his stuff yet. Uh, it's all been bad trout and then we've segued off into Sharda. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think, uh, I mean, I, I think I would really like to do the Celestial Toy Maker. Yeah. Because I think you can yeah, do some really, really trippy sequences with that. But, uh, Thank you. Um, but yeah, that's, that's one I think I would like to try. Oh, that's cool. I mean, if a missing story, say tomorrow, if a missing story did resurface, mm. what, which one would you most like to see? Faceless ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, there's always that worry that, well, I say worry, it would drag you, yeah. I would be ambivalent about it, so I'd be really happy that it turned up, but at the same time, it's likely sad. But then they'll probably just have us still finish it and go and release both. Um, but no, I'd, I'd welcome any, any, any returns. To the archive because they're important bits of history and well, would it be great if, if specifically we were from time war machines <laughs> that was the only thing if we were like oh perfect we could just drop it yeah like, from macro yeah, i'd love to i would actually love to see this work from time war machines <laughs> well it'd be good if you saw it and it was rubbish and everybody hated it and then you'd feel vindicated yeah it's okay which might happen right did you ever start work on that rough and tumble scene or was it just no, it, for, for, it was always cut from from day one of the production um I knew that, well, when I, when I saw the animatics for that come in, I thought, well, I'm sure something's missing from episode one. And then they just said, oh, it was, it was going to be too much to, to get it done. So we we'll just had to cut it, which is a shame. Um, but as I say, hopefully it turns up one day and we can see a topless smile of tears. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, you're also an effects wiz because you've worked alongside Chris on the Blue X doing the updated effects for season 10 and season 23, that's due to come out, which Chris has very kindly put some of the exclusive clips to see later. I mean, what, what, what's it like enhancing the story? Because it, it gives it just a new perspective almost. I mean, it was always on a bucket list for me that, that I wanted to do a, a, a new special effect, because I mean, I think I used to email, annoyingly as a kid, Dan Hall, who used to do the the old ones. So, as a kid? As a kid, I, I think I must have been around about 14 or something. Right. And they would just send clips going, look at what I can do. And looking back, I was like, no, we couldn't. It was terrible. Um, so it was nice to be asked just randomly out of the blue if I could tackle some of the new effects for Planet of the Daleks. Because uh, it was one story that I already attempted when I was a kid uh, to redo the, the, the model army sequence. Uh, and that was great fun. And it's nice to just give it a, a little bit of a, a clean up. Yeah. The, I mean, similarly with the effects, Chris, you helped on the Logopolis uh, with the drone footage at uh, Job Roll Bank. Yeah. I mean, how, how was that? That was really fun, actually. I, th I, think, I think the nice thing about when we did, uh, have people seen season 18? Yeah. The box yeah. I think, I think that the really nice thing there was that normally when we do the updated effects, it's kind of, you're kind of picking, which story would I, oh, I like that one. Yeah. This one could be, you know, it's a, li a little bit of a, of a uh, subjective choice that you're making. And with Logopolis, I think that the suggestion came through from Richard Bignall to say, actually, there's something proper that we can help here because the crew had originally intended to go film at John Old Bank and that hadn't been possible and so they built a, a very decent model for the time but we were saying actually we could go to John Old. we could go and film all these plate shots and film it for real and and so it felt like a very logical thing for us to be doing a really good use of the of the, of the blu-ray range and so I pitched up on the day and it's um, uh, Tim O'Brien I think is it Tim O'Brien uh, the who does a lot of stuff with Brian Cox uh, and works at John Hall, and Tim is a Doctor Who fan, and has been telling people for years, when he shows them out, he said, this is where Tom <laughs> Baker died. And I was saying, that's not really quite true, is it, Tim? Like, because it's like, it's, like it, 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 it's the Powers Project and all this. And, and he goes, shh, now I've been telling people, this is where Tom Baker died. And he was so excited to actually let us film that. And so he can now show people the clips when they come out and say, look, look, he's, he's, he's falling off our radio telescope. Uh, and it was just really funny. It, it was just me wandering around in some fields, 
with some drone operators for the day, and trying to fix a few logic bits of the story, because there's all this stuff like, when you watch it, there's a scene when the TARDIS materializes in front of the telescope, and the doors open away from the telescope, and Adric runs out, but he runs towards the telescope. And we were like, well, this doesn't, you know, because the model and the location shoot, they haven't really talked to each other, they've kind of confused it. So in a nice way, it was an opportunity to to resolve a bit of the geography and make it a bit more elegant, maybe from the time. But you can still watch, the nice thing is you can always still watch the original mm. uh, update. The, the original effects are still there, aren't yeah. they? But not replacing them. Yeah. I mean, Chris, you're, you're a one-man band because you're a writer, director, and producer. I mean, and you've made many wonderful documentaries for the DVD region, and I'll now Blu-rays as well. How did you get involved with these Blu-rays? Oh, well, I thought I, I thought I was done, actually. <laughs> I, I, I did kind of 40 on the DVD range, yeah. and it was, uh, it was a, I've always been a fan, so it was a real realisation that I was making documentaries in my job, and thinking, why aren't I doing the Doctor Who documentaries that are being made? Why can't? So I came into the range quite late, and people like Ed Stradling, a good friend, have been had been working on it for a while already, and I came in in about 2008 and did about did 40 docs in the space of five years, I think, for the DVD range. And by the end, we started a bit shit. You know, the kind of early ones I did are not very good. And then we got better, and by the end, the final ones that we were doing, we did stuff like Toby Haydock uh, looking for Peter one, when he goes to find Peter R. Newman, and we did the one with Toby and the Havoc team, and uh, we did the Living with Levine, when Toby, got, you know, so, the, the, there's a, there's a kind of Toby theme to this, but 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 it, it was a point where we were feeling a lot more confident and saying these can be proper tele programs with proper tele production values, but they just happen to be for a very specific, an uber uber specific audience, and that's the I think the joy of them is that in theory, hopefully, it should feel like somebody is making a big documentary just for you in a way that you would never find on a, on a TV channel. And, and that was finished in 2013, and I went off and did other stuff for telly, and then... Uh, you did um, the, the CBBC, the Hour School. Yeah, yeah, yeah so I've done a lot of stuff for CBBC. I'm working on Country File for the Beat now, and I've done stuff with, with different presenters, Paul O'Grady and Emma Willis, and we, we, we were doing lots of telly docs. And then Russell, Russell Minton, who's the boss of the Blue Ray range, got in touch and said, actually, we'd love to, would you come back and do some more, and, and I think it's been a, a really lovely time actually. Where on the collection, I feel like I was saying this in the green room before that Doctor Who fandom, Doctor Who as a whole, feels a little bit. Uh, it's in a slightly tricky spot at the moment, and it feels like there's a lot of division and a lot of debate and arguments sometimes, and, and things I don't agree with. Uh, and I, the thing I really like about what Russell's done with the collection with the Blue Image is they they kind of they're all joyful in their own way. We're not saying everything about the series was always wonderful, but we're focusing on the things that made us love the show in the first place. So each one should feel like a love letter to that era. Now, season 23 has always been a bit of a divisive, marmite kind of series. For me, it was the first thing I ever watched that was Doctor Who. And so for me, you know, that nostalgically has a real importance. So we come at it saying, let's give this as much love as we would give series 13 or 14 or, or one or, or whatever it might yeah, be. Yeah. Let's, let's make this a big deal because it's a big deal for some of our audience and maybe the rest of the audience might reevaluate it and feel a bit more kind you know, towards it. I'll show you a clip if you like. Yes, I'll have a clip. I need you to make me a deal uh, because I probably shouldn't be showing you clips today because they're going to show some of the BFI. So if I show you some clips, it can't go on the internet, okay? You can't